Hi guys, today we're going to take another look at LLMs, in particular ChatGPT, and I just wanted to talk about several of the use cases that I use ChatGPT for on a fairly regular basis. And this is really not an exhaustive list for sure. There's a ton of things that you could do with ChatGPT that I haven't even thought of, but these are just very common things that I find myself doing uh, over and over again. So as a result, I've actually subscribed to ChatGPT and I found that it's a very useful tool because the value is really in the time savings that you can have by using this tool for a lot of different applications beyond just some of the more basic ones like asking it questions. So I'm gonna just go through my list and talk about the way I use the tool and maybe this can help you find new ways to use ChatGPT as well. So here's my list. And of course, I'm going to start off with text generation because that's one of the most obvious use cases for ChatGPT and LLMs. And this encompasses a wide swath of different things. And by text generation, we're talking about just generating text from a basic premise. So if I wanted to write a joke or I wanted to write a poem or song lyrics, whatever it might be, I could easily do that with ChatGPT. I can say, write me a silly poem about cats and watermelon um, and this will then attempt to write a poem about cats and watermelon so kind of two random topics there and it's looks like it's you know rhyming and everything it's got good meter and all the things that you would expect from a poem in a world quite odd on a sunny plain their cat and a watermelon is often rain the tail Tell both zany and fun about a feline feast and melon sun. And then it goes on to expand on that. So again, just the silly poem. And if I read that to my daughter, she might think it was kind of silly, but you get the point. It's very useful for generating these kinds of things. And you could say, uh, tell me a joke about watermelons and cats. And let's see what this says. Uh, what did the cat sit next? Why did the cat sit next to the watermelon? Because it wanted pause and seed it wanted to pause and seed the moment ah ha ha okay funny yeah pause and see the moment okay i get it it's kind of funny and it's a dad joke for sure but it's it's definitely something that's uh something that i think is kind of corny but yeah you get the point it's got some ability to have some humor as well as generate text on similar things like this and of course you can generate text for any number of different things and that's kind of the essence of what this is about is about predicting what you want from a particular context that you're giving it and it's able to do that with relative ease so let's go back to our list here and take a look so translation is another very useful tool especially for llms translations uh, and llms just take translation to a whole new level because uh, prior to LLMs and uh, natural language processing, translations were a little hard to do with deterministic algorithms. Like you can look at a dictionary and get one-to-one -one correlation between words, but oftentimes when you're translating in that way, it's hard to get context. And context can have huge implications in the way that you translate words, especially things like idioms. Or in some languages, some words might have meanings that don't directly translate into other languages. And that makes some translation work hard. So I've learned to translate a couple of different languages. I've studied uh, academically French, Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. And I've also learned to speak Thai as an adult and when I lived in Thailand. And this is all in that process. You learn how to detect nuances in the language. So LLMs, with their ability to detect not only context, but also have nuance in that context can aid in translation work. So let's go back over to this and ask it a question. Um, can you, um, you tell me how to say hello? Um, how are you in Thai? And um, this should be able to translate that phrase, hello, how are you, into Thai and says, um, uh, says Sawadi uh, Kun Bin Ying Nai Bang. And oh, yeah, that's right. Okay, Kun Bin Ying Nai Bang. Okay. Uh, Ying Rai Bang. Okay. Yeah, that's close. Oh, it's uh, this right here is um, the Thai. And uh, there's the phoneticization of that or the transliteration of that. And uh, very um, accurate translation. And if I was to maybe take this silly poem up here. Uh, let's see if this even translates in. Uh, let's just take one stanza rather than translate the whole poem. Um, can you 
translate this into Greek. And let's see if it does it. And uh, I don't read Greek well enough to uh, read that translation, but apparently it's translating that. So um, it does give you a note here saying translating poetry is challenging, especially because of poetic nuances of rhyme and rhythm and can be lost in translation. Tran uh, the above translation is not a meaning, but it doesn't necessarily preserve the poetic feeling of the original, which, okay, it was able to detect that this was a poem and it's able to translate the meaning, but not translate per se the, the poem meter and the poem rhythm. Okay. So there are some limitations on what you can do with that, but still you get the gist of what it's attempting to do with that translation. So very useful. And I hope that this will continue to grow, especially as uh, these continue to evolve and they continue to take on more capabilities in their language translation process. So what's our next one on our list? Answering questions. So this is a great way to get answers, quick answers to questions. Now, the caveat here, of course, with questions is this is built on a data set and it's trying to detect nuances and context and it doesn't always get things exactly right. Sometimes the results it produces aren't necessarily truthful. And so you kind of have to take the answers it gives with a grain of salt, just validate what it's saying against uh, some sources that you trust. So it's just a good way to seed uh, research though. And so that's one thing that I like to use this for because it gives you a lot of the or surrounding context for a particular context um, or an event for instance. So let's see, tell me about the Berlin Wall. And uh, this should give me quite a bit of context around uh, the Berlin Wall and what it's talking about. So it's talking about background and then the construction and then the characteristics of the wall and then, of course, significance of the wall and then, of course, the fall of the wall uh, in the late 1980s. And um, all of this it provides some ways that I can use this particular event and use this generated text here as a platform to do deeper research into this. So this is talking about the, the broader context in the Cold War between the United States and the United Kingdom and France and the Soviet Union. Berlin was uh, in East Germany and it had a Soviet controlled zone. There's a, a uh, allied controlled zone. And then of course uh, it was built around uh, in East Germany. Uh, they wanted to defect to West Germany, but they built a wall around it to prevent uh, the immigration in and out of East Germany. And it was just basically a wall. Um, and then it was significant bec because it showed a symbolism of divide between the, you know, obviously the communist world and the capitalist world of the West. And then of course, in the 1980s, it fell uh, as uh, Germany was relaxing its uh, policy in East Germany on the uh, communist side of the border. And then they reunified and uh, became one Germany once again. And then of course the wall was torn down with a small section still remaining. So yeah, very good context there. Uh, most of this is true. And uh, this uh, also showed a shift in the geopolitical landscape of the, uh, after the end of the cold war. So lots of context here, and you could use this as a way to d delve into things like East Germany and um, Eastern Bloc countries uh, that were controlled uh, by the Soviet Union. You could use this as a platform to uh, look at the differences between capitalism and communism, or you could look at uh, the unif the union that is like NATO and, and other allies with these three countries against the Soviet Union and its allies and, um, and so on. So there's a lot of context here and uh, you could use that as a uh, basis for doing deeper research on other tools. Or if you wanted to ask deeper questions, uh, it says, when uh, did East and West Germany uh, reunite? And uh, even with my uh, bad spelling here, uh, it should be able to give me some context around this. Uh, so just a very quick 
um, answer that question. So October 3rd, 1990 was Germany Unity Day. So again, a very easy way to do research and get some quick answers. And then you can use that to do you know, broader research off of the platform, of course. And of course, you want to always validate what it's giving you. So the next thing on the list is summarizing text. Now, this is useful in the context of ChatGPT. And so I can use this to summarize text. So let's just take this right here, this output that it just gave me. And uh, let's say, can you summarize this, uh, the following text in one paragraph? And I'm being very specific here because I don't want it to generate a ton of text. And uh, you can specify how long you want this to be. Uh, a paragraph should be, um, plenty enough to summarize this. And uh, it's going to give me just a simple paragraph, taking that text that I just gave it and putting it into a single paragraph that represents the essence of what was given to it, which was text it actually generated. So uh, again, able to summarize something like that. But another cool website that I like is this one right here called summarize.txt. And it's a, another use of uh, ChatGPT, and this is just using the ChatGPT algorithm behind the scenes. But what it allows you to do is take a YouTube video, and um, it takes the transcript from YouTube videos. And so, if I wanted to uh, find a YouTube video, let's just say, um, let's take this new one from or this older video, rather, uh, from Simon Whistler on side projects here. It's a, a site that I like to uh, check out every now and then. And um, this is a fairly long video, maybe a, a few minutes, and I didn't want to watch the whole thing. I can take this URL and paste it into this right here, and then it will uh, load the transcript from the video, and then it will then use ChatGPT to basically summarize the transcript and give me just a brief outline of what's going on in the video. So, and then this one just, tells me some you know, some context here and it's talking about the 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 sea baltic sea canal in russia under stalin and um it talks about some other deadly projects like the suez canal um and um the sea baltic canal right here and then some other ones like the transcontinental railroad the uh, highway in Pakistan and some other instances like that, that were very deadly projects in the um, construction phase whenever these were built. So these are projects that ended up having a lot of people dying. And this is just summarizing the video. So if you don't want to watch a long video, but you want to kind of understand the content of the video in a very quick and succinct manner, something like this is useful. This is just using ChatGPT under the hood, but it's able to summarize YouTube transcripts from the ChatGPT engine that we just looked at. So again, a very useful tool for things like that. And of course you can copy and paste into ChatGPT to get uh, summarized text as well. So let's look at another example here and that would be text completion. Text completion is whenever you wanna kind of fill in um, some gaps and um, if you wanted to have a partial piece of text more fleshed out as part of that more text generated uh, content, you can you know, kind of drop that into ChatGP and ChatGPT and it's able to produce some uh, text beyond that. And so if I said, can you, can you finish this sentence? That's declaring my intent. Um, roses are red. And then I say dot, 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 and let's see what it does. It said, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. So it's able to finish that sentence based on you know these three words right here. So it's, it has text completion capabilities like that. If there was a quote, for instance, like, um, can you finish this quote, um, December um, 9th, I think? I don't even know if I got the date right. A date that will live in infamy from the, the um, a speech that uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt gave. And so, okay, so there it's able to finish the 
the quote right there, December 7th, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. So it's able to kind of detect what I'm getting at. I got the date wrong, of course. And uh, it, of course, corrected the date and then finished the quote and corrected it as well. So something like that. It, so it gives me some context around that quote as well. So uh, text completion, you can put in partial quotes and it's able to uh, use that as a way to kind of shape uh, the response and it's able to detect, oh yeah, that's what he's talking about. And here's the context for it. So certainly something that is very powerful with this particular one. Now here's one that I use quite often and this code generation. Now code generation is only going to apply to people that do coding, but truthfully, this skill is becoming more integrated in a lot of other lines of work beyond just pure programming. So folks that work in IT, especially, even if you're not a coder, having the ability to generate some kind of code to do common tasks is something that will be very useful with things like ChatGPT. So code generation uh, can be useful for all kinds of things. Now, uh, ChatGPT understands all kinds of languages. So if I say, uh, can you generate a algorithm algorithm to detect prime in i don't know python and uh, it should be able to generate a pi uh, algorithm that will generate um, primes and uh, this one is working on that by simply doing a for loop and it's checking one, uh, it's checking three, two, uh, one, th these right here. Okay. That's what it's doing. It's just checking it against these and otherwise it's just iterating and, um, by six until it gets larger than the, the number that you pass in. So, uh, yeah, a prime algorithm, uh, starting with one and then going up to five and then using iterations over six to do that that's a fairly you know clever way to do that it's much faster than if you just checked them one at a time or you could say generate this in python and uh, let's add a, and rather than python let's change it to javascript and see what it does and uh, it will regenerate the same algorithm probably in javascript um and uh, it's basically just checking it um, through these right here. And it's checking to see if a number is prime. So very useful algorithm there um, using a different language. Another thing that you can do with this is can you is use it to describe code. So if I take a code sample, let's just say, uh, let's just take this code sample right here. And it says, can you tell me what this is doing? And uh, paste in the code. And uh, this code is a snippet you, that you provided. It's checking for uh, in is prime and basically looking for um, a condition. And that's just describing the code in prose, what's going on inside of this code snippet right here. And it's just able to unpack it very quickly. And it's just able to understand the code and then explain it using just very simple prose right here. So something that's very useful with this. So it can kind of go both ways. If you don't understand code, you can paste it in here. And if you want to generate code, it can definitely do that. Um, another cool thing that you can do with this for code is like, can you generate um, a, some SQL to select all of the records in a table where uh, let's give it a field name, random field name. Um, my, where the date, date one is uh, greater than, uh, is later than 90 days ago. And so I'm just describing it and it should be able to generate a SQL statement based on that, um, that particular context right there. So here it's generating the text from that SQL statement. And uh, this one is just some different databases. So uh, assuming that your SQL database is like MySQL Postgres and SQL Server, and it's, you know, this is more generic, 
uh, SQLite, uh, which is a desktop database. And then of course your table would be your table name. Cause I didn't specify that I had to hit regenerate. Cause sometimes there, uh, the algorithm will disconnect from my local context or whatever it is, a network error or something like that happens and just hit regenerate and it's able to try again. But in any case, you get the idea that it's able to generate SQL. You can use it to generate CSS and HTML and JavaScript, Python, C sharp, C, uh, any language pretty much. It, will understand that language and you can use it to um, generate code. It's very useful, especially if you're a programmer or some kind of net admin, if you want to create shell scripts or uh, things like that, it's got all kinds of things like that. Now, content moderation, I'm not going to do an example of because uh, again, I'm not going to risk it flagging my account. And I actually have kind of hit up against its content moderation before because in my writing, uh, what I will have in my writing, sometimes I have a scene that has a fight scene and uh, fight scenes are violent at times. And so as I'm writing that, I might want to have uh, ChatGPT help me massage the language some. So I'm writing it and I'm writing my books, I'm writing my novels and I have this fight scene and I say, can you improve this? And it will look at the text and says, um, this is violence. You can't use this to promote violence. I'm like, I know you can't use this to promote violence. This is fiction. I'm writing a book. It doesn't necessarily understand that per se. And so it will say, can't, sorry, can't help you with this. And it will just not work. And so I have to maybe, you know, change some things about it so that it will actually take the input and, and then maybe modify it after the fact to make it more violent, if you will. In any case, it's very uh, uh, sensitive to topics like violence and, and any kind of uh, sensitive topic that is kind of in the, the, the culture at the time. And you have to take that um, into consideration when you're working with this. But another thing that you're uh, going to be able to use this for is searching for ideas. Now, um, it's not a search engine, so you can't use ChatGPT to get links to websites, but you can use this in the way that you can uh, work with it when you're answering questions. If you want to get uh, answers to questions and then kind of seed searches, it's very good at finding uh, answers, but it's also good as a way to uh, provide context for searching for things beyond what you, you have this idea in your mind. It can give you search terms and things like that. So if you can describe what you're thinking about, it might be able to give you some some more context around that. Um, say if I was thinking about a tree house and I didn't know what that word was, can you you tell me what a structure in a tree is called that children play in? Now this is obviously a tree house, but I can put it in something like that, and it's and the structure is called a parrot node or what the heck is that? Um, that's not what I was talking about. It got that, um, all wrong. And a no, um, uh, that's kind of funny. It still thinks I'm on programming. So let's, let's modify the context here. No, uh, I am talking ab about real children and the, and the structure they play in out side in a tree what is that called <laughs> so let's see if it gets able ah i thought you were talking i know what you're referring to uh, okay when children play in a structure built in a real tree outside that is called a tree house or sometimes a tree fort and so then i would say oh yeah it's a tree fort and then i can say can you tell me how to build a tree house and it might tell me how to build one. I don't know. Building a tree house is a fun project, requires careful planning, the right tools. And of course, it's going to tell me how to pick a tree and design the tree house and gather materials and all the fun stuff that you use in making a tree house. So that's kind of funny that um, it didn't have the ability to context switch. It was still thinking I was talking about... Um, programming. So, um, yeah, you have to kind of context, switch because it does maintain some continuity in the context that you're talking about. And this particular session has been all over the place from the Berlin wall to, uh, talking about tree houses and generating silly poems. So, uh, it's probably just 
confused right now. So let's go to our next one, sentiment analysis. This is another really useful one. Um, there's two ways that you can use sentiment analysis. So um, first you can say, what is the nature of this text? So um, if I put in, this is a piece of junk, I never want to see it again. And then you can say, uh, can you analyze uh, the sentiment, uh, sentiment, I can't even spell today, of this statement. Now this one's not very as useful. It says this sentiment of the state of this piece of junk is strongly negative. The word, the phrase piece of junk and never want to see it again indicate very strong dissatisfaction and aversion towards the subject that might be referring to. Now, if I want to use this in reverse though, I can say, um, let's say the same statement, I can kind of reverse this and turn it on its head. Can you make this, this statement sound more satirical? And it will take something that's got some kind of negative sentiment and then it will try to have you get more of a satirical sentiment as as well. So basically communicating the same idea, but doing it in a uh, satirical way. Why it's practically a modern masterfully. It's simply heartbroken if I ever laid eyes on it again. Uh, that's not too great, but yeah, it worked okay. Um, another thing you could do with this same kind of thing whenever talking about you know, sentiment, you can change the, the mood or the voice that you're talking about. So if I had um, something like this right here, Let's just take this text right here. Can you make this text sound more professional? And it will take this statement right here and try to make it sound um, professional sounding. Or you could take the same thing and say, can you make this thing sound more casual? And it will take the, uh, so statement and make it sound very casual. So basically when somebody says, this is a piece of junk, I never want to see this again. They're really not a fan. Phrases like piece of junk and never want to see this again are pretty clear giveaways. Uh, they're not just into it. And so very casual say ver statement versus this one right here. And this is very useful when you're talking about uh, modifying content to have a more uh, different sentiment in the way it expresses the idea. And this is useful for like crafting emails or writing blog posts or uh, working with uh, things in social media, whatever it might be. I, I use this kind of thing when I'm writing the video descriptions for YouTube content. Um, I'll have an idea and I'll try to make it the best I can. Then I'll say, hey, can you make this um, sound more exciting or more catchy or things like that. And it will attempt to take what I've written and, and make it better. And it doesn't always work. Sometimes it generates something that I was like, and now nah, I just stick what I did, but sometimes it generates something that's better. Sometimes it generates parts that are better and you can kind of take the essence of what it's writing and combine it with what you're saying. And then of course produce something that is uh, to you or liking, but you can use this kind of how to kind of help shape that if you so choose. So very useful in that context. Another great thing about this is brainstorming. Now brainstorming, of course, is just coming up with ideas. So similar to searching and answering questions, um, this can give you less. So if I was trying to think of ideas, um, um, let's just say, can you give me some ideas for great YouTube content uh, for uses on chat GBT. Let's just use that and let's just see what it comes up with. Um, and uh, here, here's some a tutorial series on beginner's guide to chat GBT, advanced techniques, best practices, challenges, funny, you know, pose, funny questions, stump the chat bot, uh, real world applications. That's kind of the essence of this video, uh, comparisons, pitfalls with, uh, this ethical and philosophical debates around this collaborative projects. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could do. I mean, it's giving me, uh, just a ton of different <laughs> options here. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of things that you can do with this. Um, lots of cool things. So, very cool. Um, just a long list of brainstormed ideas. Now, would I do these? I don't know. I would have to kind of do some research on some of these to see what 
they might be useful for if it would generate good content. So there's things that I can do for research in YouTube that I can kind of take some of these ideas and plug them in and uh, see what it produces. And uh, that will then you be useful in generating content and um, give me some ideas for future videos. Um, I don't know that I would do any of these, but yeah, just a way. It's just a way to do brainstorming. So certainly an idea generating contents, uh, context there. And lastly, one that I use for use it for all the time is grammar checking. Now, grammar checking um, is one of the places that this thing can really shine, but it can also be uh, something that will trip you up occasionally as well, because you have to be very clear with ChatGPT that you just want to do grammar checking. So let's just uh, type in what I'm going to type in first. And so I say, uh, I want to declare my intent. So you have to be clear with ChatGPT. Can you uh, check the following for grammar and punctuation, grammar, spelling, and punctuation, punctuation, and while not changing the words too much. And um, now I'm just going to type in a sentence and um, um, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to, you know, correct it as I type it. This is a sentence and Let's try again. This, I'm correcting as I type it. This is a sentence uh, that I am trying to type without hitting backspace, even though that seems to be the normal thing to do when I am typing like this. And there's probably a ton of typos in that. And yeah. All right, let's see what it does and uh, see if it changes the structure. Oh, it gave me two responses. So here we go. Um, this one says, uh, even, uh, of course, here's a revised version with the correct spelling, grammar, and punctuation. And here's a revised version of your sentence. And this one says, this is a sentence that I'm trying to type without hitting backspace, even though it seems to be the normal thing to do when, uh, when I'm typing. And this sentence is uh, the sentence that I'm trying to, uh, to type without hitting the backspace, even though it seems normal. Yeah, this corrected misspellings, uh, punctuation, and removed the extra am. And okay, they're pretty similar. So I guess I could go with this one right here. And uh, it generated two responses, and that's uh, that's kind of nice. And so this is the, the corrected sentence from this gobbledygook right here. So. Uh, you can use this on a larger section of text. Of course, there are limits. You can't take like an entire novel and paste it in a chat GPT and say, fix this for the grammar and spelling issues. You would, uh, you can take paragraphs at a time and paste them in here and it will generally work fairly well. And um, it will capture things like commas and spelling and uh, capitalization issues and, and some and subject verb agreements and things like that and usage issues. And uh, it will it's able to find those kinds of things and just fix them if you want to want it to fix it rather than uh, walking you through a wizard uh, to fix them all and suggesting things. So very powerful tool for just fixing the, the mechanics of language. And I, I use it for that all the stinking time because I am notorious for misspelling words and missing uh, inserting missing commas and having extra commas and all that just because when I'm thinking and when I'm writing, I don't always think about the grammar parts of it, or I just kind of gloss over it and I don't really spot it as I'm typing. So that's a very useful tool, especially when you're crafting emails and, uh, or if you're like me and you write fiction, you can take your text, put it into this and say, you know, can you fix the, these mechanical things? And it will you know, work on that. It'll then show you the kinds of things that it will fix. Sometimes it gives you a list, sometimes it doesn't, it just depends. So very useful for those kinds of purposes. So this is just a sampling of the ways that I use ChatGPT. And of course, there are a ton of other ways that you can use this. I didn't even touch on how you can use this for image manipulation. That's, that's a capability that it can do that I really have never even explored, but it's certainly one that I'll probably look into because it can do certain things with images, but it's really up to you what you want to use it for. So my interest in this, of course, is the text editing and the text editing capabilities that it has. And that's very useful in writing, which I do quite a bit of, especially as a book writer. And of course, and the daily things that I do with 
emails and other kinds of tasks like that. And it's something that I will gladly pay for and continue to pay for because to me, ChatGPT 4 is great. It's better than ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo, which is decent, but ChatGPT 4 just takes that to a whole new level. And it's something that is well worth the 20 bucks a month because it accelerates my workflows and my daily tasks. And I get that time back to do other things that are more meaningful rather than some of the more tedious things like editing and proofreading and those kinds of things that a computer can do for me and do it much faster and much more accurately. So if you like this content, please like and subscribe to the channel. And if you have interest in this topic and you want to explore it more, drop me a comment in the comment section down below. Let me know what you'd like to explore with ChatGPT and these kinds of technologies. I'm probably going to be doing more videos in this same vein. I'm going to be looking at the OpenAI APIs on Azure because there's something that I want to try to do with that that I think could be pretty cool and very useful for me as a writer. And then I also want to kind of look at this from another angle, and that's how you can, can uh, work with this in a more local context without needing to be connected to the internet. Now, that's not, of course not going to be using uh, ChatGPT4, but I want to use code with an LLM and have a smart client that I can take with me or install in a local context or in an edge context that will allow me to have some of these capabilities on the edge without needing to be connected to the internet. So certainly look for that video as well. So these are just some of the ways I'm going with this. If there's other videos in ChatGPT, of course, let me know. And as always, thanks for watching. If you like this content, please consider subscribing to the channel by clicking on the subscribe button. You can also like this content by clicking on the thumbs up or share this content with your friends and also comment in the comment section down below. You can also find me online at www.blaze.net or on Twitter at The One Mule. And as always, thanks for watching.